Greens, Groats Worth of Wit, Bought with a Million of Repentance, 1592, is a tract published as the work of the deceased playwright Robert Green. It was published as a short book or pamphlet, a form that was popular and which contributed to the lively intellectual life of the time. Green's work is written as a moralistic tale, which, towards the end, is revealed to have been autobiographical. During the course of the story characters introduce song lyrics, fables, and some sharp and resentful criticisms of actors and playwrights. It appears to have been written with the idea that the contemporary reader would try to figure out which actual persons are being represented and satirized by the characters in the story. The pamphlet is most famous for a passage which appears to allude to William Shakespeare, who was then starting out on his career as an actor and playwright. The main body of the text is an account of the visit of two brothers, Roberto and Lucanio, to the courtesan Lamilia. This is followed by the later career of Roberto as a playwright. The actual authorship of the pamphlet has been disputed. Some authorities consider it to be wholly by Green himself. Others take the view that it is a heavily revised compilation of material left by him. It has also been attributed to the writer and printer Henry Chettle, who arranged its publication. <laughs> publication Groatsworth was entered in the Stationers' Register upon the peril of Henry Chettle on 20 September 1592, two and a half weeks after Green's death on 3 September. XXO die septum br. Wilm. Writer. Entranced for his copy under Mr. Watkins' hand, upon the peril of Henry Chettle, a book intertooled Green's Groatsworth of W.Y.T., bought with a million of repentance. VJD. It was printed for right by John Danter and John Wolfe. Chettle, who had entered into partnership with Danter and William Hoskins in 1591, and who continued to work for Danter for several years after the partnership dissolved, claimed in a prefatory epistle to Kind Heart's Dream 1592 that, because Green's handwriting was illegible, he Chettle, had copied out Green's manuscript so that the work could be licensed. The publication caused a literary scandal. Because of its comments about other playwrights. The booklet was one of several publications that followed Green's death, occasioned by fascination with his dissolute lifestyle. Others written in the first person purporting to be his dying statements were The Repentance of Robert Green and Green's Vision. Grotesworth was reprinted by Thomas Creed in 1596. <laughs> <laughs> Contents The pamphlet begins with an account of the brothers Roberto and Lucanio Garinius, sons of a wealthy usurer. Roberto is a scholar, while Lucanio is being groomed to take over the family business. After their father dies, leaving Roberto only a groat to buy a groat's worth of wit, Roberto takes his now wealthy brother to visit the dazzling courtesan Lamilia. Lucanio is enchanted with her. The characters tell fables and comic anecdotes and sing songs. Roberto attempts to make a deal with Lamilia to share the proceeds if she can fleece the naive Lucanio, but Lamilia tells Lucanio about his brother's proposal and kicks Roberto out of the house. Roberto then meets an actor who tells Roberto that he can make a living as a playwright. Two years later Roberto is a successful playwright and Lucanio is penniless, having spent all the money he inherited on Lamilia, who has now discarded him. Roberto employs his brother, but Lucanio leaves and spends the remainder of his life as a pimp. Roberto's success does not stop him from squandering all of his money until he is left dying, once again finding himself with just one groat left. The narrator then states that the life of Roberto is similar to his own, and exhorts his readers to follow a more honorable path, summed up in ten precepts. He then addresses three unnamed gentlemen his quondam acquaintance, that spend their wits in making plays, telling them to reform their ways. One is referred to as a famous gracker of tragedians, who has denied the existence of God. The other is a young juvenile, who co-wrote a comedy with Green. The third is no less deserving than the other two, but has been driven to extreme shifts to survive. All should beware of actors and newcomers, especially. 
an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blanquet verse as the best of you, and being an absolute Ioannis factotum, is in his own conceit the only shake seen in a country. The pamphlet continues with further exhortations to repentance followed by an allegory about a grasshopper and an ant, the former representing fecklessness, the latter representing thrift. The text ends with a letter to his wife, which is said to have been found after Green's death. Green apologizes to her for his neglect and exhorts her to look after their son. <laughs> <laughs> Identities of the playwrights Shakespeare reference The comment about an "'upstart crow beautified with our feathers' is generally accepted as a reference to Shakespeare, who is criticized as an actor who has the temerity to write plays Ioannis factotum being a Latin equivalent of "'jack of all trades' and is possibly taken to task for plagiarism or excessive pride. The line in Grotesworth Tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, alludes to Shakespeare's Henry VI, Part Three, which contains the line, O tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. I. I. V. 137 Scholars are not agreed as to what Green meant by his cryptic comments or what motivated them. Green complains of an actor who thinks he can write as well as university educated playwrights. He alludes to a line in Shakespeare's Henry VI, Part Three, and he uses the term shake scene, a term never used prior to Grotesworth. Most scholars agree that Green had Shakespeare in mind, who in 1592 would have been an upstart actor writing and contributing to plays such as the three parts of Henry VI and Richard III, all of which were likely written and produced although not published prior to Green's death. Hans-Peter Bourne has argued that Green's attack on the upstart crow was provoked because, in his view, Shakespeare may have rewritten parts of Green's play and act to know a knave. Believing that Thomas Nash is, by far the stronger suspect, for having written the passage regarding the upstart crow, Catherine Duncan Jones points to instances in which Nash may have had reason to be provoked. Baldwin Maxwell and Stephen Greenblatt have speculated that Green was the model for Shakespeare's Falstaff. Greenblatt has also suggested that a line in Hamlet is a dig at Green's phrase in Grotesworth, "'Beautified with our feathers'." Polonius, reading a letter from Hamlet addressed to "'The most beautified Ophelia,' comments disparagingly that "'Beautified is a vile phrase.'" Jenny Sager calls the suggestion that Falstaff was based on Green fanciful and "'cringeworthy. Topic: The three other writers. The three playwrights whom Green admonishes were members of a coterie of university-educated writers associated with Green, known as the University Wits. The famous Greco of tragedians is generally taken to refer to Christopher Marlowe, educated at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, who was accused of atheism. Green comments that he is an admirer of Machiavelli, who is several times mentioned in Marlowe's work. It was once commonly argued that, Young Juvenile, was Thomas Lodge, co-author with Green of the comedy A Looking Glass for London, however, Lodge was out of England at the time, and Green's language implies that all three playwrights were aware of Green's illness. Most modern commentators now agree that Green had in mind Thomas Nash, educated at St. John's College, Cambridge, later called Gallant Young Juvenile by Francis Mears in Pallades Tamia, an apparent allusion to Green's earlier use of the epithet. Green's phrase, bombast out a blank verse, appears to be an allusion to a remark by Nash in the preface to Green's Menophon, 1589, in which Nash defended Green against his detractors, who Outbrave better pens with the swelling bombast of a bragging blanquet verse. Nash was also much younger than Green, unlike Lodge, which would explain why Green calls him sweet boy. However, there are no known comedies co-written by Green and Nash. 
The third writer is usually identified as George Peel, educated at Christ Church, Oxford, who, like Green, was notorious for his chaotic lifestyle. Peel may already have collaborated with Shakespeare. The early play Titus Andronicus is now generally taken to have been co written by them. Both Peel and Nash may also have worked with Shakespeare on Henry VI, Part I. According to Gary Taylor, there is considerable evidence for Nash's dominant role in the authorship of the first act of the play. Topic. Authorship Some scholars hypothesize that all or part of Groatsworth was written shortly after Green's death by one of his fellow writers. Henry Chettle has been the favored candidate, and was suspected at the time, since the manuscript from which it was printed was prepared by him and was in his handwriting. The publication offended at least two contemporary writers. Chettle responded to the complaints in the preface to his Kind Heart Stream, published later that year. He denied writing the work, stating that he had only transcribed it from Green's original manuscript into his own hand before publication. He added that he had no wish to know one of the complainants, but wished he had edited out some of the offensive material about the second. It is widely believed that the two authors he comments on are Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare, though this is far from certain. Chettle wrote, About three months since died M. Robert Green, leaving many papers in sundry booksellers' hands, among other his Groatsworth of Wit, in which a letter written to divers playmakers is offensively by one or two of them taken, and because on the dead they cannot be avenged, they willfully forge in their conceits a living author. With neither of them that take offense was I acquainted, and with one of them I care not if I never be. The other, whom at that time I did not so much spare as since I wish I had, for that, as I have moderated the heat of living writers and might have used my own discretion, especially in such a case, the author being dead, that I did not I am as sorry as if the original fault had been my fault, because myself have seen his demeanor no less civil than he excellent in the quality he professes. Besides, divers of worship have reported his uprightness of dealing, which argues his honesty, and his facetious grace in writing that approves his art. Thomas Nash was also accused at the time of having written it. He denied it in the 1592 edition of his book Pierce Penniless, calling the work a scald, trivial lying pamphlet. In 1969 Warren B. Austin undertook a pioneering computer-aided analysis of the work of Chettle and Green. He concluded that Groatsworth was written by Chettle on the basis of word choice frequencies. Austin's analysis convinced many scholars, but in 2006 Richard Westley came to the opposite conclusion, accusing Austin of pre-selecting evidence to support his view. Westley concluded that the pamphlet was the work of Green and that the evidence of Chettle's quirks was the result of his role as a transcriber. Steve Mentz, writing in 2008, argued that Groatsworth included a substantial amount of material written by Green, but that its idiosyncratic structure suggested that there was significant editorial intervention in the source material creating an unusual sort of collaboration between Chettle and Green. <laughs> Notes <laughs>